You haven't been around for like three weeks, it's been a while, and it's great to have you back because the last video that Sai came out with was, uh, uh, or the last couple of them were, were a little too successful. Uh, I think the channel was doing a little bit too well, quality a little bit too high, and we were farming the subs and stuff. We gotta drag that back down. We gotta bring it back down. So it's wonderful to have you back. Today we are going to be jumping back into Battletech lore, except not really for the mechs and stuff. We're going to be talking about the orbital version of the face of the franchise. A ship so ubiquitous, so famous, it's such a ridiculous icon, it may as well be the face of the franchise when it comes to space combat. And for all the people in the comments that'll disagree with me, well, if you think I'm wrong or missing something, then no, I'm not. You just have incorrect opinions and you need to get over that. You gotta you got get those changed, man. <laughs> you can't be having those incorrect opinions around here. We don't tolerate those. <laughs> Head to the mechanic and get those things fixed, man. We don't tolerate that shit here. And today, we're going to be talking about the McKenna class warship, the backbone of the Star League fleet, multiple-time Olympics winner, and one of the longest-serving and most decorated warship classes in the entire setting. It's also shaped a little bit like a dick and named after a guy guy who spent his free time vaporizing islands from orbit, so it's gonna be a good video. Why don't I grab you a picture of it so you can kind of see what I mean, Steve? So tossed in there in picture printer, the big ones at the front, the ones that got the giant fins on them, those are the McKenna class. They are long, cylindrical, and a little bit phallic looking if you glance at them from the right angle, but they are hilarious. And we're gonna be talking about the full history of them today, from the guy they're named after, to the technical aspects of the ship, to the history of how it's been basically kicking around and killing things for 400 years. Long lifespan of those, those ships there. Dude, it's like the Energizer Bunny. Just keeps going. But first, before we get into things, shameless shill and introduction, generic greetings and welcome to Science Insanity. We talk about nerd stuff, and I drag my friend, co-host, and science illiterate along with me to listen. Say hello, Steve. Hello. Ah, the soulless introduction. Ne never gonna change. Never gonna change. Never gonna change. It's good to have you back. But if you somehow end up enjoying this video, then leave a like, subscribe, all that, since every little bit does help fight the algorithm. Especially when we make uh, a very high quality content yes. like this, clearly. Yes. If you're feeling especially generous, consider checking out our Patreon and buying me a coffee or feeding my co-host Steve. Or if you just want to hang out with other Turbo Nerds, we got a Discord, recently updated with group finder channels, so people can ping each other and me to be incredibly annoying while trying to find groups to play video games. Everything linked in the description below if you're interested. And with that, on to the actual video. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess for all of the people viewing, uh, there's a little bit of a bait and switch, but you know, it's hilarious, so I kept it in anyways. The first segment is going to be the history of the name and the dude it was named after, James McKenna. Since, you know, you actually listen to the name and you're like, ah, oh, the McKenna class, it you know, sounds like one of those important background lore characters that every setting has. You just come up with something that sounds cool to name their ships and stuff after. But it is, it is just so much more than that in the lore, Steve. Like, th this is absolutely insane. You see, up, up till now, I kept, I was thinking you, you kept saying mechanic class, and I thought that was your uh, segue after the initial joke to go to the mechanic and get your sense of your uh, <laughs> opinions fixed. So, I mean, we're off to a really strong start today. Yeah, welcome to Science and Sanity, everybody. Only the highest quality content here. But since people are probably going to feel like it's a bit of a bait and switch, uh, if you're not interested in that, there will be a timestamp up on screen or whatever that'll just take you straight to the ship part where me and Steve talk about that and its history and all of the wonderful guns and random garbage stapled to it. If you did stick around, though, which I really hope you did because it's going to be hilarious, we're, uh, we're talking about Canadian Genghis Khan, conqueror of the entire universe oh. and founder of the Terran hegemony. Canadian snow, I can't believe this. Get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to start with the guy the, sh the uh, ship is actually named after, because the story of this man is just, it it's its so good. While I was doing research for the topic, I, I became a fanboy for this man, because the raging nationalism in me just couldn't let this absolute meme go. And I'll sum it up for you real fast. That being, in general order of how the events happened, Canada just does it better. McKenna is a flannel-wearing, forest-dwelling True North lumberjack. Every nation on Earth got bitch-slapped back into line, and McKenna democratically ended democracy, and then got voted in as God Emperor of Mankind or some shit, and the first empire in humanity was just Big Canada. And nobody will be able to tell me otherwise. Big Canada now exists, God. This is happening. Get me out of here. Get me out of this weird, demented reality. Oh yeah, don't worry, it doesn't matter how hard you complain or argue, the reason you're doing it is because you know I'm right and that's why you're angry. Let's let's actually move on to the lore and get away from the memes a little bit, because you see, this guy was born in the Terran Alliance, right? The Earth-based super state that existed before all of the sci-fi garbage that Battletech eventually becomes. 
every other major nation were pretty much just ideas or notions. A lot of the great houses and families and stuff that would go on to become major players didn't really exist yet. We're, we're in the before time of Battletech lore. Born in Canada in the northern Yukon, this dude spent the first decade and a half of his life essentially just being a lumberjack, living and surviving in the harsher northern climate and just not even starting an education until he was already well past the age of 12. So he's coming into his military career as a, a basically a mountain man. Like, he may as well be the Sasquatch. Bro was lumberjacking before he was 12. This is, this is outstanding news. True Chad amongst men. That's what the lore says, man. Just like all Northern Canadians, he was born with a beard and an axe. It's just how we come out. And a, and a tin of maple syrup. But if it weren't for him going into the Interstellar Navy, he probably would have been just another random woodsman chopping down trees and farming syrup in the true north. But alas, such a flannel-filled fate wasn't to be. McKenna took an opportunity to head south to the United States and go through what was then Naval College to become an officer in the Terran Alliance Navy, which isn't like ship-going or ocean-going Navy, this is like in space, because we're still far enough in the future that that's a thing. His track record was hilarious and god-awful at the same time. He famously bounced back and forth between single-handedly breaking like every record they ever had and being the best officer anyone had ever seen, more medals than a North Korean general, before promptly punching the shit out of his superiors because he thought they were stupid and would tell it to them to their faces. Based. Yeah, the, uh, both of those extremes are exaggerations, but I mean, I imagine at least once McKenna had a mental pinned to his chest, and then the moment the ceremony finished, he just immediately roundhouse kicked the dude, giving it to him off the stage. Mostly, though, the real issues with his uh, promotion and demotion happening back to back constantly was that he kept disagreeing with everyone and telling them that they were stupid to their face, and that he was the only one who really knew what the correct ideas and solutions were. History would prove him right, but we'll get to that later. But you can't be so cocky about it this early on, man. Come on now. You'll never get anywhere. Look, just because you have main character hair and energy doesn't mean people are okay with you just flaunting that shit. Go save the world or something first, and then you can act like the arrogant asshole everyone knows you will eventually be. For years, he climbed the ranks, did his duty, and generally performed well in the service. Although his attitude never really changed, and his reputation would haunt him throughout his entire career, holding him back. And this is where he began really shaping the fate of the inner sphere yet to come in the setting as a whole. You see, he pushed really, really hard for militarized jump ships and vessels and stuff to supplement the current armed forces of the somewhat united Earth. Up till this point, the military was just a bunch of transports and fighter craft. Basically just the, the uh... Greek navies, uh, just tri triremes and biremes, uh, nothing actually meant to fight each other. Oh, uh, that's a very historically... You know what? I'm not even going to touch that. You're 100% correct, Steve. I typically am. I, I typically am. <laughs> Indeed you are, sir. <laughs> Indeed you are. <laughs> so McKenna was like, wait a minute. Humanity is busy manifesting its destiny across the stars like we've always done on Earth. Eventually, though, you know, he's like, there are going to be other nations and empires out there in the stars, and we're going to have to learn to coexist with each other. And then we're going to realize that they're god-awful and we need to kill them. And we are really going to need bigger boats and weapons to facilitate that. And so he set about producing the first ever proper warship. In the year 2314, the first true battleship was built, the Dreadnought, alongside six sister ships that followed soon after. And it's also really important to mention that, like, nobody agreed with him at this point at all. Everyone thought he was crazy, or just wasting a whole bunch of money, or just doing this as an ego project, because he's like, well, I'm an admiral, I want battleships, her der. And so he took constant flack and criticism from people that were like, it's too expensive, it's pointless, it's nothing more than a vanity project, and they were so incredibly wrong, it's not even funny. Take take a wild guess where this is going, Steve. Uh, I'm gonna say there was an all-out war within 20 years. You are astoundingly correct. I'm just on. I'm just on it today. I mean, we we I might have gone off to a little bit rocky start, but <laughs> a little bit doesn't really describe it. But yeah, you're you're cruising, dude. You're really on the mark today. You're like glancing into the future. So this is this is where the culmination of the guy's story really comes in. The marginally united Earth was rushing headfirst into an all-out civil war. Everyone from military units and warlords randomly opening fire to try to carve out their own little kingdoms, civilians and political extremists took to the streets to kill each other and fight over anything and everything they disagreed about, and this was rapidly dragging the rest of the surrounding worlds like Mars or Venus, and even some of the more far-flung colonies into the conflict and instability. 
So guess what McKenna did? Take take a wild guess. You were you were very uh, close. Like you... did, did 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 he take his warships and simply uh uh bombard people until Holy they stopped fighting? Holy shit, he's a genius. How did you know, Steve? I stole your script. <laughs> uh wait, wait a wait a, wait a minute. <laughs> so this this man went, "Oh, wait, I have the biggest and only warships in all of humanity. Gunboat diplomacy time. Let's restore the status quo and save everybody. And then he stopped and he thought about it for a few more seconds. And he thought really, really hard and realized, wait a minute. I have the only warships. I have the only gunboats in the highest ground possible. So he parked himself in orbit, opened a communications channel to the entire world, no, no one was actually listening at the time, but he made sure that everybody saw him raise his proverbial hand to speak, and he grabbed their attention by vaporizing several islands from orbit, one off the coast of Scotland and one nearby Australia, if I remember correctly. Maybe he yeah, vaporized? I, I mean, technically, Britain is an island, so he could have vaporized Britain, and he could have vaporized New Zealand. Let's let's just assume he did. Well, one can hope for Britain. Yeah, let's let's just assume he did, because that's I think that's an improvement to the world. Vast improvement, yeah. Yeah, so he just straight up removed them from the surface of the Earth in one of the most violent displays of raw power in, like, ever. Pretty much the entire world just stopped fighting almost immediately and just sat down quietly while he spoke. And speaking to the entirety of the planet... He delivered what I can only describe as the biggest dick move in all of human history. He essentially laid out his grievances and ideas in a huge manifesto sort of thing that he called the ultimatum, so you know this is going to be good, and basically went, paraphrasing very heavily, uh, the government of Earth is awful and has failed you, the people are sheep and have no idea what they're doing, the politicians and political parties are absolutely god-awful and should all be hung, and all of the people who are fighting this war are idiots and if they're not going to kill each other already should probably just die to save us all the trouble. It was, uh... Bro was on something. <laughs> yeah, dude, he was he was going off on literally everybody. And he finished that off with a call to arms, saying that every single person on the earth that was done with all the conflict, all the corruption, all the bullshit, should just go home. Just put down their guns, sit down, leave this crap alone, and anyone who's going to continue fighting is going to die. So saith me and my magical or else button. And surprisingly enough, this this actually worked perfectly. The vast majority of professional soldiers just shrugged and went, okay, and went back to their barracks, probably looting a whole bunch of shit on their way, dropped their guns, and just left. Many of the smaller or less influential political groups just entirely disbanded or went home, and as it turns out, regular people were uh, actually living out the eat the rich fantasy, because as it turns out, a lot of the politicians, a lot of the people who had started this war, a lot of the rich and powerful, were uh, dragged out onto the street, beaten to death or hung, just straight up murdered by the mob. Uh, we, we love a good old Mussolini. <laughs> they, they got Mussolini'd. In a frighteningly short time, he took total control of Earth and de facto control of most of the rest of human space that was, like, within their control, just by virtue of, I have weapons and you don't do what I say or I'll introduce you to a boot. Pretty common way of how people do things like that, but... He also, at this point, went about creating the Terran Hegemony Charter, the founding document and piece of paper that would officially create the Terran Hegemony, the founder and birthplace of the Inner Sphere proper, and the model for totalitarian and dictatorial rule for humanity going forward. Extremely influential piece of uh, literature that he wrote up here. And when he wrote the Charter, which essentially stated that the new King of Humanity would be an elected dictator, he, of course, threw his name into the ring, and ended up winning by a landslide. Mm, I wonder how he did that. Well, I wonder why he won by a landslide, man. Yeah, there's a... The, the lore, all sources, state that the people in general were just so done with all the bullshit that they just went, okay, I'm done with this democracy garbage. Just here, you're, you're the new god emperor of mankind. Just do your thing, but leave me alone so I can live in peace. And he legitimately won, but then there's a lot of, like conjecture where people are like, eh, that's kind of ridiculous, that's kind of dumb, I don't believe it, he probably rigged it, and he probably rigged it. So, so what if he did? I mean, what, what, what are they going to do about it? Absolutely nothing as well. Like, yeah, what are they going to do? Throw rocks at the spaceship in orbit? Good luck, idiots. 
but he became the first Director General and Lord Protector of the Terran Hegemony. Insert Spaceman meme looking at Terra, wait a minute, it's all the Canadian Empire, McKenna cocks the gun behind them. It is now, fucko, and there's nothing you can do about it. So this, this random-ass lumberjack from Northern Canada became the first God Emperor of Mankind. God, God bless this man. But do you have a flag? <laughs> yeah, yes, they did have a flag, actually. Oh, well, they, they, um, they made... see, his flag was bigger, so um, he wins. <laughs> <clears throat> so this, this guy is great. He does deserve, like, an entire video to himself, like we gave Snord, and you know, probably shouldn't have included him in this one, like, in as much depth as we did, but, like, the more I researched the McKenna class, the more I was like, man... This topic is missing something, and this guy is just so funny. He just he just crept into the script. Yeah, you, you, you had to get a little bit of background on him. I mean, I mean a little bit. I, gotta, gotta give a gotta, gotta give a little bit of reasoning for the namesakes here. Even even from a fictional universe, this man is fucking doing it again. He weaseled his way into my script and took it over without me even realizing it before I had. Can't believe this. <laughs> yeah, just how many guns does he have pointed at you currently? <laughs> I don't know, and that's the scary part. Oh. <laughs> But finally, that's that's the end of the like chapter one with the name explained why the most powerful and coolest warship in the whole setting is named after this dude. Let's actually talk about the ship. Reminder to Canadian to put in the uh, timestamp here. Uh, uh, the editing Psy will do it later in the future. He'll he'll figure it out when it's his his turn. Right now is recording Psy, and I don't have to worry about those problems. Where would you like to start, Steve, on the next part, though? You want to talk about the technical details, and we can laugh at how a lot of the newer art make it look like a uh, bit of a dick? I, I want to talk about the shape of it. Okay, well, I mean, that's not really... In Is there the... any technical reasonings why why it's like that? Is it a uh, better aerodynamic flow across the uh, the surfaces of it? Uh, or the non-existent atmosphere? Uh, so these ships can't can't go into atmosphere. They, they would, like, explode. They would they would crumple on themselves if you tried to take them down to a planet. So, uh, no. The reason oh, I see. The, that could be a slight issue. Yeah, the the reason it looks like that is surface area. Uh, you'll notice in those pictures they got like a whole bunch of what look like tubes and ports and stuff all over the sides. Uh, they made yeah. it a really long tube like that because this thing has an absolutely hilarious number of guns, and they just needed to keep making the ship longer to fit them all on. I see. But this shows you what I mean. Like it actually details the guns and stuff on it, and. Yeah, they they it, it it looks like that because they just plastered the whole thing in hangars and guns and missile ports. So let's let's start with the most fun part of any sci-fi stat list, the weapons and stuff, because it's always fun to explain how a building-sized gun can destroy a skyscraper-sized ship. The McKenna class is one of those uh, one of those kinds of ships where when they were designing it, they asked how many guns do you want and how much armor would you like. And they just kept responding yes whenever a bigger and bigger number kept being listed. This is one of the most heavily armed ships in existence. In Battletech, there are a number of different categories for ships like destroyers, cruisers, you know, the standard list copied over from real life naval history. This yeah. is the biggest and most ridiculous of them, pretty much bar none. There, there are a couple ships that are bigger, but they're like one-off weird prototypes or actual ego projects from people trying to tell the universe how big their package is, but... We ignore those because they're stupid. So we've talked about weapons and stuff in Battletech before and how they're often really stupid or really big or really hilariously big and stupid. And we've talked about the opposite end of that, like the clan's pigeon laser so that, you know, none of their beautiful mechs are soiled by avian menaces. Bird shit is a true menace, man. You can't be, can't be downplaying the effects of it. These things are an entirely different level of stupid. Like, this, this is a whole nother level of dumb. So, the McKenna has a primary, secondary, and tertiary armament made for different engagement distances and targets. They're not, like, progressively smaller or anything, like where a battleship has its main guns and then secondary guns. They're all, like, the biggest capital-grade weapons you can find. They're just made for shooting at different things and set up in different, like, weapon batteries to work together. Let's, let's go with the reverse and start with the third rank of weapons, which are the large naval laser. These are colossally big versions of the blue large lasers mounted on battle mechs and have the fastest travel and highest ease of use. Since it's a laser, you know, if the tracking system misses first time, it can just go, oh shit, and sweep that fucker back around a few times until you eventually cut the dude coming at you in half, so 
pretty good for that, although they were used mostly for mainline ship engagements, because the McKenna carried a small fleet of fighters with it as well to do most of its point defense. It had 12 of these lasers in gimbaled turrets. In that last image, you can see some of the uh, weapon pods that look like they're actually turreted on the sides of the ship rather than just static emplacements. Those are the lasers. And the 12 of them are spaced pretty evenly across the whole ship, covering every angle and arc of fire. One step up is the veritable sledgehammer of stupid that it carries. You notice the really, really big barrels sticking out the front of the ship? Those are naval autocannon 40s. The biggest, biggest guns humanity has ever built in the setting, like canonically. I think there's only like one that was bigger, but that's from the Jihad era, and we don't talk about that because it's stupid. So you're saying these are the, the rat level guns? What? The P-1000 rat. Oh, the tank. I Yeah, I guess. Like, there were bigger guns than that in real life. This is the biggest gun ever built, period. Like, that's just what it is. Uh, they're the size of a building, and I, I do I do mean the size of a billion, building. T take a take a wild what, guess. What type of building here? Uh, like a three-story ground floor commercial, second, third floor residential kind of mid-rise. That's a tall building. Yeah, it's pretty big. Take a wild guess how heavy they are. Um, what's the overall weight of the ship? It's it's just about two million tons. Okay, okay. Well, uh, you see that gave me a little bit of a ballpark on what, where I had to be at. <laughs> um. We're we're gonna go um we're gonna go eighteen tons. Eighteen tons? That's what I'm going with here. Eighteen that's it? That's what I'm going with. That's it? Are, are we just talking about we're talking about one or are we talking about the whole thing? Like talking about one. Sixty two point eight. Sixty two point eight tons is your final answer for a single gun. Yes, sir. Uh you are monstrously undercounting it. Each gun is four thousand five hundred tons. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I missed a couple of zeros on the uh, on the calculation there. Yeah, just just a couple. The U.S. has the Arleigh Burke cruiser destroyer, whatever that thing is. It, it's about nine thousand tons. Two of the twelve guns on this battleship weigh as much as one of those ships. <laughs> These things. When I told you they're the size of a fucking building, I wasn't kidding. They're the size of a building. They're enormous. But uh, yeah, it's got 12 of these guns. Uh, from what I remember, it's got four of them facing backwards so that if people are pursuing it, it can shoot the shit out of them that way. And the rest of them are uh, on the front or sides aiming forward for like volley fire or to assist the broadsides. The actual projectile they fire is really slow compared to the vastness of space and they're easy to dodge at any reasonable distance. So they're not ideal for super long range capital class slugfests. They do have the highest damage output of any capital grade weapon in the entire setting, but they're incredibly unwieldy, which means they're not really used as the single main weapon of a ship. There are 12 of them, like I said, and they are supplemented by the next weapon type, 12 giant multi-munition launch tubes strapped along the spine of the ship. Now, these are a little different than most missile systems in Battletech. Like, normally you have to choose between, like, you gotta pick your poison. Do you want short range, really high damage, medium range, medium damage, or long range, low damage? You know, uh, SRMs, MRMs, and LRMs, there are some specialized multi-missiles, but not important. This thing has 12 AR-10 class launchers, and they are equipped with literally everything you could think to throw into them. They could have anti-small craft, high-tracking, high-speed munitions. They could carry planet-busting nuclear warheads and everything in between. So while there's only 12 of them, they provide the flexibility and gap closers in the McKenna's armament so that it's got devastating anti-everything firepower at every engagement distance. And now, the main weapons, the really big guns, the primary armament of the McKenna class. In that picture I showed you, you'll notice along like the center and rear part, it looks like there's like a like clusters of four guns or something in there. You see those? Uh, they look like missile pods, but yeah. Yeah, they're they're not missile pods. Those are equipped in large groups so that they can battery fire them in sequence or just laugh as they broadside alpha strike everything into someone and pretty much just evaporate them. Those are 48 heavy particle cannons. To put this into perspective, one of them, similar to the autocannons, can cripple a small ship. This thing, with these particle cannons, can reach out and zap you at like a thousand kilometers away. 
and hit you with so much energy that it will vaporize contemporary ships. The only reason the Mechana doesn't just like one tap delete people out of the universe is because it would probably overheat itself if it tried to fire that many particle cannons at the same time. Or, or it's just like the uh, creator. I can't believe this. Really modeled it in his image. Pretty, pretty much, yeah. The, the ship is not only designed with his name, but in his image as well. It's truly glorious. Like, if it had an entire escort fleet of, like, cruisers and destroyers and all of that, it would still be the majority of all the firepower in the fleet. It's absolutely ridiculous. Now, like I mentioned, it could melt itself if it fired all of this, and sinking heat in space is really, really difficult, which is why it kind of looks like a fish. You notice all those fins and stuff sticking off of it? Yeah. Yeah, those are colossal radiators to get rid of the uh, heat from the engines and the heat from the weapons. And you know how battle mechs have, like, a few heat sinks and stuff? Well, uh... Yeah. Yeah, take a wild guess how many heat sinks this ship has. We're not talking about, like, the fins and stuff, right? We're talking about the actual... The actual modules, like heat sinks. How, how okay. many blocks of radiators and stuff did they put into this thing? We're gonna go with, um, 1,387. Wow, you're really lowballing these numbers. No, it has 6,325 double heat sinks. So it's it's like 13,000 regular heat sinks all, all over this thing. It's it's very big. We we knew the luck was going to run out at some point. I mean, we can only go so far with me being right on these things. Yeah, you you kind of ran out with the guns. It looks like you used all of your good luck for the next year on the first couple answers. Yeah. So, uh, uh... Be prepared for no more correct answers the rest of the year, boys. <laughs> oh, don't worry. That's what everyone shows up for, and there are, all the viewers are used to it anyways. It's it's very big. This ship comes in at 1,400 meters long, so just under a kilometer and a half. 1,600-ish meters tall from tip to tip of the sails, although it's only like 400 or 500 meters or something if you completely take the fins off. And it weighs in, like we said, at an absolutely eye-watering 2 million tons. The McKenna is one of the largest warships ever built in the setting, and are arguably the most dangerous ever built. But there's more. It's also a hybrid ship. Do you notice in the middle that there's those bulge, those like bulge areas and it looks like they got big hangar doors on them? Yeah. Yeah, it's also a carrier, like I mentioned. It carries 50 dedicated fighter craft in two split hangar bays, and 16 small craft like heavy bombers, transports, cargo ships, or in some cases dedicated drop ships which carry like a whole bunch of mechs and soldiers and stuff to invade a planet. It is absolutely massive with its bulk and can still accelerate at like 3 G's in a straight line, or if it needs to rotate or turn or just move on any other axis, can hit like 1.5 G's fairly easily. So it can accelerate and move very quickly. These numbers just ain't adding up in my head. They probably are, but they just ain't adding up in my head right now. And with that having been said, with all the technical aspects of it, let's uh, let's move on to the history of it, which is going to be a little bit shorter because, like I mentioned, you know, the spaceships in Battletech get no love, man. Like, they're, they're a mostly abandoned part of the setting, and it's such a shame. The history part's going to be a little bit shorter and a little bit more meme-heavy, but, like, it is what it is. Ready to learn how the McKenna is also a two-time back-to-back Olympic gold medalist? Okay. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, let's let's start at the beginning. So originally, the McKenna was put into service some 300 years after the death of the legend himself it was named after. Produced by Blue Nose Clipper Ships, a company based on Mars, the McKenna was first rolled out of dry dock in 2652, and instantly became the pride of the Star League fleet. At the time of its building, it was the most heavily armed, armored, and powerful ship ever built, like, by a ridiculous margin. It was also seen as, similar to McKenna, like, the biggest ego ship ever built. The people serving aboard it loved the ship, it was almost always chosen to be the flagship of fleets, and McKenna-class battleships were seen as postings for only the most elite or respected of personnel. Despite the fact that the time of the Star League's fall, there were, like, almost 300 of them, and they made up, like, a seventh of every warship the Star League had. I don't know, man, there's probably a few dumbasses on there, but hey, who am I to disagree with military culture? We gotta have the overwhelming majority, though, be, be deserving of it. Overall, it was a monstrous improvement over everything else of the day. Though, just like the issue that James McKenna had while making the first warships ever, the McKenna battleship was very early on beset by allegations of cost overrun, pointless scale, unnecessary firepower, and being, well, 
is stupidly expensive. But when the first Marshall Olympiad rolled around, all critics were silenced. It's always that until in, until it's actually needed, man. Garbage. Everybody complains about the super weapon until you drop kick the enemy straight to hell in the first engagement. It's weird how that works. I mean, I mean, humans would have been destroyed without the Spartan program. I mean, the. <laughs> The McKenna class. I mean, McKenna himself. I mean, I, I feel like McKenna himself was more of the end-all, be-all villain of the story. But yeah, that that analogy works. I mean, that's up to debate. I mean, that, that's just your opinion. So I know that this is a completely pointless and rhetorical question, but do you know what the Marshall Olympiad is in the setting? Do you want to take a wild guess from the context clues they've given you? I'm gonna you? say it's the uh, it's it's like rim pack. Uh, it's uh, go go between all the. Uh, navies of the of the setting uh, to see which ship is the best. Yes, but not actually. In Battletech, the Marshall Olympiad is like the biggest set of war games in the entire universe where everyone shows up to compete. But unlike a lot of the stuff in real life, it's not a show. It's an actual competition. And on the wiki, like this is verbatim, it says, Great pains and efforts were taken to avoid un any unnecessary casualties or destruction, but deaths did still happen and destruction was still common. They, like, they, they were using live ammo. This was like an actual fight where they were testing all the capabilities of their stuff. So it was rare. People didn't die all the time, but it was common enough that like having a bunch of your soldiers die or having like a small warship get crushed or something was common enough to not bat an eye. I see. So different units competed in mock battles to prove who was the best. Different weapon systems underwent trial, competition, and direct combat to see which ones were the most effective. And in the first Olympiad it took part in, the mechanic class was tap dancing on the foreheads of its competition. It could outshoot, outmaneuver, outfight, and outlead any other competitor while functioning as a support or command vessel for like entire other fleets of ships. This thing was so powerful that eventually it was considered completely pointless to fight them one on one unless you had your own to counter it. So the first time it competed, it pretty much ruled the competition and won gold in every category. It, it monopolized every medal. It's like, I take silver, gold, and bronze all at the same time for every event, because I'm just that good. I see some free real estate here. I'm just going to take it. <laughs> oh, this is your medal? This is yours? No, this is mine now. <laughs> I take this. Do you have a flag to put on your medal? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, this also meant that the McKenna class painted the biggest target of all time on its back. See, this is why you simply don't don't bring it bring it to these things. You, you never bring your your absolute top stuff that uh, you try to keep secret. Well, see, here's the thing, right? The the solution to that problem is if you've got the weapon that's absolutely ridiculous, you either never use it at its full potential, so your enemies are always caught unaware, or you make so fucking many of them that it just doesn't matter. And the Star League chose to make an absolutely shit stupid number of these ships so that it really didn't matter what counters the enemy came up with for them they were just like lol forehead to problem eventually the problem will die i mean they ain't wrong but so when the star league civil war happened and the stefan amaris also known as fat genghis khan had uh, had his big oopsie and tried to take over the star why league. do we have all these different genghis khan i don't story? know it was funny to me at the time and my brain is not capable of forethought or memory, so just just go with it. It is what it is. We all got that monkey brain activity gold, going on. Goldfish brain. I can't remember more than 15 seconds after I've done something. When the conflict started, Kerensky and his fleet of Star League loyalist ships had around 280 of them, although I think there was like what, 300 of them in total or something like that. That target on their back was a bit of a problem. This meant that they were shielding a lot of the other ships in the fleet from getting obliterated since they were so big and so scary they were absorbing all the focus fire like a tank. But this also meant that by the time the conflict came to a close, uh, there was only some in like 30 of them left in any form of fighting condition. Over 90% casualty rate. That does not seem very good. No, it was a little... I'm pretty sure it's the highest casualty rate by like an obscene margin of every ship class that engaged in the conflict. And, you know, when Kerensky did his big nope and made his exodus with the Star League military to go fuck off into deep space, uh, he took the last 20 of them with him. So they never actually saw combat in the Succession Wars. Probably a good thing, because one of these ships could easily render a planet barren of life if they were allowed to just park in orbit and fire their weapons at the surface. That could be it. 
considered a good thing, I guess, depending on, on who you yeah. want. They, uh, they did have an incredible resurgence, though, because the clans kept these things in mint condition. These were, like, the biggest, most powerful warships the Star League had, and you know how the clans worship the Star League and Big Daddy Soupstock like their personal god? Yeah. They had most of the ones that were brought with them during the Exodus. They still had them when they invaded the Inner Sphere again, and the conditions of the battle were very different the second time around, because the Inner Sphere had nothing. Nada. No warships. No no armed transport. They, they had dick. Dick all. So, unfortunately, there's really not much else to talk about. The only other thing we could go into for this ship is if we dived into the various battles it's been a part of, uh, like the various things it participated in during the Star League Civil War, but I'm not going to cannibalize potential future video topics and money to, to further pad out this video. I think we've done enough to talk about it today, and we can, uh, we can milk those other topics another day. If you would like to, uh, would you like to know more, is basically what he's saying. Uh, so, if you want to hear us... <laughs> Here those topics be covered, feel free to comment and say so. Yeah, the uh, the last thing that I would like to share is the ship actually went through a redesign uh, when Aerotech 2 was created. They tried to revive the game once with a like second set of rules and it flopped just as badly and that was it, but the only thing that came out of it were, uh, were a few redesigns. Oh, that's supposed to be the same thing? They are the same ship. Oh. I'm going to go ahead and press X to doubt on it. Yeah, the redesign looks like ass. I hate it. It's terrible. But thankfully, uh, those images I showed you earlier, those are like the resurgence of the original art style. They're actually mm -hmm. good. Yeah, and that's that's pretty much everything. The McKenna class, named after one of the most fuck you, I'm right characters in all of the setting, and proudly carrying on that tradition by being the most fuck you, I'm awesome ship in the entire setting. Any final parting words before we head on to the patron thank you and another reminder to like and subscribe? Uh, thank you to the uh, Canadian lumberjack Genghis Khan for this. <laughs> So before we fully end off, a huge thank you to the people supporting the channel, especially the extremely generous people who are directly donating to us because they're insane and decided that we're deserving of money. And a special thank you to the even more insane people who went to the next tier up, feeding my co-host Steve. So huge thanks to David G, the original, Augie, Levin Bravo Crunchy, Terry Higgins, Pedro Munoz, David G, the other one, Silencer, Vox Apollyon, Phoenix, BT Legend, Electro Boy Eleven, Logan Maynard, Mickey, David Armon, Creedome, Robin Stop It, Fenrir Striker, Tachi Takane, He's Dead, Pixie, Virtus, Fabric 445, Anchovy Bob, Mini Crustacean, Charles the Snap, Polly, Eric Jones, Joseph Holiday, Zombie the Zerker, David B, Sweet B, Rastro, Le Butcher, Stabby Taco, Nomquam, Brian Hall, John Gabrielle, Joshua J. Lee, The Hayfork, Unit Zero, Tarly Bob, Kiwi Warrior, Douglas Jerma, Jason Vigo, Screaming Stuka, Darius D, Exo Thermic, Roscoe292, Christoph Grimberg, Baron AJ, CT7274, Freedom Trooper, Steven Venture, Zephyr Windstar, Harbinger029, Oscar Reed, paying with New Zealand dollars, Skogan, paying with what I can only assume is North Korean currency, I have no idea how you're calling in from there, but thanks, and the new guys, Wolfie and Mitchell Costley. I, I don't know what this currency is, all it says is 60 NOK, and as far as I'm concerned, that's North Korean dollars. That's, that's North Korea, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that's uh, that's everything. Nothing else to add. The video is functionally over. Outros are hard. Goodbye.